Today, we're going to talk about inflammation, silent inflammation. Are you at risk? Well, I'm going to share with you how you can find out if you are. There's some special lab tests and some other things I want you to pay attention to in this video as we kind of, not a deep dive, but a pretty interesting dive into this entire kind of ambiguous, vague thing called inflammation. So first of all, let's just talk about what is inflammation, right? Many times you'll hear people say, oh, I have inflammation, but what does that mean? Is inflammation always bad? Is it, can it be good? Well, that's a really important question. So first of all, inflammation is a biological response, right? To the body's immune system, to some harmful stimuli, such as pathogens, damaged cells, or uh, irritants, right? So it's normal. It's a it's a vital part of the body's defense mechanism, really helping to protect us from infections and injuries. So for example, when something harmful or irritating affects a part of our body, the immune system responds by releasing white blood cells and other things called cytokines, and then some other protective molecules that go to the affected area. Now that process leads to the characteristic signs of inflammation like redness, heat, swelling, and pain. So why is inflammation important? So first of all, inflammation, like I said, is crucial for survival, right? It helps wounds heal, it combats infections, it repairs tissue damage. And without inflammation, infections and injuries would become deadly, right? Um, as the body would not be able to heal itself. This is what we describe as acute inflammation, right? It's responding to something that has just happened. That's typically short-term and localized, and it's typically beneficial and necessary for healing and, like I said, survival. So we're going to deep dive a little bit more into kind of just how can we measure inflammation and then when does it become actually harmful? So first of all, inflammation can be uh, measured in various um, biomarkers in the blood. Common markers include CRP or C-reactive protein. So this measures elevated um, levels of uh, inflammation that can signal infections or chronic inflammatory diseases. And we're going to get into a second here. What's the difference between HS CRP and CRP in just a moment? But there's some other things I want to share with you. There's also the ESR, that's a erythrocyte sedimentation rate. So that test measures how quickly red blood cells settle at the bottom of a test tube. Um, faster rates include in cause or indicate more inflammation. So you'll have, see a higher number. And then there's other things called pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these include things like we may have heard of interleukins or IL-6 um, and tumor necrosis factors or TNN-alpha. A TNF alpha, um, which can really med be measured to measure um, inflammatory activity. So let's talk a little bit uh, about what's the difference between HSCRP and CRP. So CRP, which is the C-reactive protein, it's produced by the liver, right? And it is made in response to inflammation. It's just a general marker of inflammation. Um, I basically, sorry, I got a, there we go. Um, it detects acute inflammation and infection in the body. And that could just, again, be normal response to something that needs to be dealt with. So normal levels of CRP are typically below 10, and but you can also measure to measure um, ongoing inflammation. So what is HSCRP? So that stands for high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And it's basically a just more precise measurement of the CRP test, right? It measures the very low levels of CRP, which can really um, help you identify low-grade chronic inflammation that you may not even be aware of. That's kind of the silent component of this. And it's very important to be very and very helpful at your risk to determine your risk of cardiovascular disease. So typically normal HSCRP is less than one moderate risk is or average risk is between one and three, and above three is considered at higher risk. Again, this is a great marker to get if you have a history of family heart disease, hypertension, if you have any type of chronic disease, overweight, or even perimenopausal menopause. And we'll get to that here in a minute, but I would encourage you to measure HSCRP. And I do this regularly with even my patients who are seemingly healthy, just to get an idea of what's going on. Sometimes 
even chronic inflammation, let's say you have a, something going on with your uh, mouth, maybe a dental infection, you may see a slight elevation in HSCRP as, too, as well. So, and you may not even realize, let's say you had a um, root canal and there's an infection here and you don't even know about it yet, or maybe there's something going on here and you have this elevation in this HSCRP, then we start maybe go looking for like, what's the cause of this low grade inflammation? Maybe we need to do some additional testing. And I'm not saying we have to chase our tail on it, but it is something just to keep a, 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 you know, a pulse on it, right? Let's just see what the, let's see what's going on with our low grade inflammation that might be occurring in our body and causing damage that we wouldn't even know about. So I want to back up a little bit more here and really speak to um, why inflammation causes chronic disease. And so remember, acute inflammation is protective. Chronic inflammation can be detrimental. Um, so chronic inflammation occurs in the body's immune system or the immune response is continuously active, right? It's often due to persistent infections, prolonged exposure to irritants or autoimmune disorders, or if the body's um, capacity to store energy and it's, uh, let's say the subcutaneous uh, tissues and those cells start to break down because they're over capacity over capacity, you will see that cause that kind of that beginning of that low grade inflammation and it shifts where the that is actually being stored. I mean, it just leads to this cascade of events that can put you at higher risk for prediabetes, di um, type two diabetes, heart disease, changes your lipid panel. We'll go into this a little bit more here, but let me just speak a little bit to to three things. Um, one, inflammation around inflammation and chronic disease. First of all, there's waking, right? So chronic inflammation can interfere with the um, body's ability to regulate insulin and contributing to insulin resistance and eventually weight gain. So like I said here, the adipose tissues or your fat cells release pro-inflammatory cytokines and that perpetuates the cycle of inflammation and weight gain. I've had many, many patients who were significantly overweight or obese and we measure just things like uh, a CBC or white blood cell count or their CRP and it's off the charts, but it's been like that for many years. That is not normal versus I have someone maybe who changes their diet and they lose the weight and they become a healthy weight and they're doing all the things that we know help decrease inflammation, which we'll get to in a second. Um, that white cell count drops, their CRP drops back down into the normal healthy range. And so it absolutely can be changed, but we just have to figure out what are those actions that we need to do for each individual person. Next is elevated cholesterol. So inflammation can affect your lipid panel. Um, basically it leads to an increase in your low density lipoprotein or your LDL. And that can contribute again to the plaques in the arteries, which we wanna pay attention to which leads me to the next one of heart disease, right? So chronic inflammation is a really big key factor in the development of what we call atherosclerosis or the plaque in the arteries. And again, as we understand, we have to halt that process in, you know, of course, heart disease is multifactorial. So, but inflammation, you can think of it as a root cause for many, many things. So if we address the inflammation or insulin resistance as well, you'll see this dramatic improvement in overall multiple factors in your health. Um, I just wanted to highlight, because I'm going through this whole menopause thing about menopause and the inflammation. <laughs> I've been doing deeper dives into this. It's a fascinating thing what this estrogen does to our bodies or lack thereof. But menopause can worsen inflammation and due to hormonal changes, I will tell you a quick story of my own is that, you know, I'm 53, I'll be 54 in about six months. And last year I was having you know, on occasion they might go six weeks apart, my periods. But after I ran a half marathon, I started having these horrible like outer hip joint pain. I was like, what is going on? I am not one to deal with <laughs> discomfort or pain. Well, not a good patient. And um, I was like, what is going on here? Why is my, why are my hips hurting? Like, and I started getting some hot flashes and I am following all the things I'm doing the soy every day. I'm exercising. I have a healthy weight. I do all those things. I manage my stress. I get the sleep. I'm eating all the whole food plant-based diet, but I began to seriously suffer with this joint pain. The hot flashes weren't super bad, but they could be slightly intense. My sleep was being disrupted. My LDL went up above hundred for the first time in my entire life. I was freaking out at that point. I was like, what is going on? And my period stopped. Now, I haven't had a period now in however long that is, what, seven, eight months. And um, I started diving into menopause. And what is estrogen doing? There's 30 different symptoms 
of menopause. And so I'm doing my workshop this month for the Healing Kitchen, which you can learn about on drmarvis.com, all about menopause. And I will tell you, I took actions to replace my estrogen in the form of patches and then the Prometium to protect my uterus. And I feel like a million bucks. I feel like I did back in my 20s. And I looked at the risk factors. I understand where I'm sitting. And there's no shame in doing things that will not only make you feel better in the present, but potentially promote your health as we age. So I am really taking a much more broader perspective on this stage of life for so many women. But anyway, menopause, ladies, that estrogen, it will mess with you. So anyway, <laughs> just throwing that out there. thought it was something important to tell you because it can promote weight gain, inflammation, uh, sleep, mood, messing with your lipid panel. <clears throat> crazy stuff. But anyway, speaking from someone, and I'm diving deeper into the science, joined the North American Menopause Society. I'm thinking about getting certified menopause because I just want to be able to help more people. But anyway, we'll get to the rest of this in a minute. But what should you be doing? There are three things you can do starting today to improve your inflammation. Really is adopt an anti-inflammatory diet, you know, I'm going to tell you, eat more plants, more fiber, that's fruit, vegetables, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, healthy fats, staying away from saturated fats or trans fats or ultra processed foods. So you want to avoid those type things, refined sugars or flours. You want to stay away from those. Those are uh, pro, pro inflammation promoting, right? They, they promote inflammation in the body by removing them. That's the first step, right? You stop fueling this inflammation fire, this chronic low grade inflammation. Next is exercise regularly. I'm about to go hike with some dear friends who have come to stay with us for a few days. I'm socializing and decreasing stress. I'm going to go exercise. That alone is going to help decrease my inflammation and it can help yours too. You can do any exercise that you enjoy, aerobic, anaerobic, resistance training, yoga, just move your body. Remember motion is lotion. For the body. Anyway, uh, manage stress. Uh, big thing, uh, you know, as I, I love to preach, maybe I shouldn't use the word preach. I love to promote the idea of mindfulness and joy and finding everything that's good and grateful that you're in your moment in your life now. So anyway, I hope you found that helpful. I go even deeper into your metabolism and and weight loss, but it also helps your cholesterol and inflammation and things. In my free masterclass, guys, please check it out. It's um, I worked really hard on it. I've created beta groups and all sorts of stuff to deliver this to you. It's basically five steps to master your metabolism and lose weight. The link is in the bio and Instagram, and it's in the YouTube description below if you're finding me there. But yeah, but thanks as always for being here with me. Oh, by the way, I also speak to the four biggest mistakes people make in their weight loss journey. Um, as we we're speaking about the five steps to improve your metabolism and lose weight. So, but as always, thank you for being here. Um, sending you joy, love, and peace and healing because we need more of that in this world every single day, every one of us. So if anything, please share that message with someone and share this video if you think it'll be helpful to someone, but be kind to yourself and be kind to someone else today, will you? Really, really appreciate y'all. Have a good rest of your day and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend, everyone.